I guess the first thing I should say, uh, uh, Charlie, thank you for the very kind introduction, but you did forget the most important uh, part of my bio, which is LaSalle College High School, class of 1967. <laughs> so. Uh, I'm a local boy, and I'm keeping my political options open, so when the choice between cheese whiz and provolone, I will take either relative to anything I can get in Washington, D.C. <laughs> um, okay, so we've got that out of the way. Um, I've, got a, uh, I've got a slide that I wanted to show, uh, and uh, we'll show it to you. This is uh, Don's. Don was very kind in describing this as the answer to uh, all of your problems. In fact, what it is... Uh, is uh, uh, something very close to one of the charts that uh, Dave Cody showed. Um, there we go. Good catch. Okay. We're going to have to change, uh, uh, change files here. Do we have it at the end? It's in the packets. Okay. In the packets, Joe. Okay. Um, let me just tell you a story behind the picture that, uh, uh, that is in your packets. Um, if I were to describe uh, the budget outlook as of December of 2007, at that time, uh, we anticipated that if Washington did what Washington does, which is to, as uh, Dave suggested in his remarks earlier, run everything on autopilot, uh, we would have seen uh, that the nation's debt would reach 60% of our collective income, our GDP, uh, as of the year 2022. So in other words, in 2007, we had 15 years until we reached that 60% of GDP mark, which incidentally is a reasonable line in the sand. Uh, there's nothing definitive, but it's a reasonable indication of when you're starting to have problems that might uh, cause you uh, to have uh, uh, difficulties in terms of your relationship with the international financial markets. 60% of GDP is the membership requirement for uh, the European Monetary Union. So it's something of a, uh, a marker of where you have budgetary problems. Between December of 2007 and now December of 2010, three years have passed on the clock and that 60% wall has moved 15 years towards us. So as of the end of fiscal year 2010, back in September of this year, our debt already exceeds 60% of the GDP. The wall has moved 15 years towards us, and that's how risky things are right now. Um, the situation has changed extraordinarily rapidly. The debt curve has gone vertical as you could see from uh, uh, Dave Cody's chart. And we are subject to substantial risk that those creditors around the rest of the world who own 45% of our debt, including China, including Japan, including the oil producers in the Middle East, uh, could decide at any particular moment, there's no reason to expect that it's gonna go on forever, could decide at any particular moment that the next time the Treasury Department has an auction and has to sell a lot of paper to raise cash to run the federal government, that they have enough U.S. Treasury paper and they just don't want to buy any more. Thank you. Uh, that is the reason why there was enough of a momentum in Washington towards trying to create the kinds of institutions uh, like the commission on which Dave Cody and uh, Andy Stern saw, uh, served and uh, let me just add uh, Charlie's words of thanks to both of them. That's, that's taken on a second job, and it's taking on a lot of uh, potential public abuse when you start talking about changing things that people would like to see go on unchanged forever. Uh, they were, uh, I don't want to over-dramatize it, but they were patriots. They served a lot for their country, and they deserve uh, our thanks for that. Um, one of the things that I think both of them recognized when they started thinking about what the uh, budget was like and looking at the numbers that were uh, uh, presented to them, we can't sit back and let this problem develop. Uh, one presumption that I've heard from a number of people is we can grow our way out of the deficit. You hear that with some considerable frequency. Uh, the argument is made when the nation got out of the end of World War II, uh, 
uh, our debt was equal to 100% of our GDP, actually a little higher than that. And we worked our way out of that situation. So we could do it again. Uh, let me pick up on Andy's theme from his remarks and just point out that we are not in our grandparents' economy right now. This is not the post-World War II U.S. economy, which is true in a number of important respects. Number one, the growth of our labor force. At the end of World War II, the troops came home. Our labor force grew substantially, and that increased the productive capacity of our economy. Right now, the rate of growth of our labor force is slowing because people like me, uh, the uh, children of the baby boom, are beginning to retire. I used to tell people uh, there's a fundamental equation of the U.S. budget problem. 1946 plus 62 equals 2008. In other words, 1946, the first year in which U.S. birth rates elevated the beginning of the baby boom generation, plus 62 years old, which is the minimum age for collecting reduced Social Security benefits, uh, equals 2008. In other words, we've been talking for decades, budget wonks or idiots or whatever you want to call us like me, have been talking for a long time about how the demographic wave was going to be hitting us. Well, the demographic wave has already begun to break. Uh, and in every given year, 62-year-olds, uh, more than half of 62-year-olds collect Social Security benefits. So the demographic wave is already beginning to break. And those people who were born in 1946, uh, when they hit 65 in 2011, which is just one year from now, will become eligible for Medicare. And of course, Medicare is going to be even more of a budgetary problem than Social Security is. So the labor force developments now are dramatically different from what they were at the end of World War II. At the end of World War II, we benefited from economic conversion. All the factories that had been building tanks and aircraft could go to building refrigerators and automobiles. We don't have that advantage right now. In fact, we have a lot of factories going empty and begging uh, because of another problem, which is at the end of World War II, all of the rest of the quote-unquote developed world had been the battlefield for the war. Uh, all the nations that were industrialized suffered dramatically. The United States was a major source of stuff for anybody anywhere around the world who wanted to buy manufactured goods. Uh, now we face intense competition, as Andy documented. Uh, from all the other developed countries around the world. So we are not going to grow our way out of this problem in the way we did at the end of World War II. In fact, the problem is dramatically the opposite, that we face headwinds while at the end of World War II our economy had substantial tailwinds that moved us more rapidly. As Andy and Dave experienced in working on the Commission, uh, when you look at the parts of the budget and you see what you can solve, there are some people who say, don't cut spending, just raise taxes, particularly on wealthy people. There are others who say, don't raise taxes, just cut spending. When you look at the reality, you can see that there is no one-way street that's going to take us where we want to go. In terms of taxes, uh, the upper end of our income scale, which supposedly is uh, a source of unlimited additional tax revenues is not large enough. There are computations which suggest that you have to take the top tax bracket, which is now 35 percent up into the 70 to 90 percent range, if you're going to look only at upper income taxpayers to fill that void. Uh, on the spending side, uh, as uh, Andy mentioned a moment ago, the rate of growth of spending per person on Medicare is faster than the rate of growth of our gross domestic product, or than our economic growth. Spending in Medicare is growing faster than our incomes. You cannot collect taxes fast enough when a big government program is growing faster than the entire economy, which has to pay those bills. So we have to deal with both parts of the budget. We have to deal with taxes and we have to deal with spending. Just to give you one final thought about the seriousness of this issue, debt, like diamonds, uh, is forever. Uh, <laughs> once you've accumulated debt, you've got to deal with it. You have to pay debt service or else uh, the consequences are unthinkable. Uh, let me just 
take you through a little bit of very simple arithmetic. Uh, at any given time, more than one-third of the federal debt matures or rolls over within one year. As many of you are aware right now, uh, the interest rate on a three-month Treasury bill is south of one-quarter of one percent per year. The long-term average interest rate on three-month Treasury bills which has had a lot of ups and downs, but if you take a reasonable average over a reasonable period of time, is more like 4%. So while at this period of low interest rates, we are piling up debt upon debt, and a lot of our debt is being financed with very short-term securities, simply because that's what the market wants to buy, you want to think about what is going to happen when we hope the economy recovers, and that three-month Treasury bill rate goes back up to its historical average. If we raise that, if that interest rate goes up, and the markets will determine that, from a quarter of a percent to four percent, the cost of paying debt service on each of those three-month Treasury bills will increase by a factor of 16. If the rate on a 10-year Treasury goes up from where it is now, which is south of 3 percent, to about 6 percent, which is more like a long-term average, the interest cost on those securities is going to double. So right now, the cost of servicing the federal government's debt is relatively low. But when the economy recovers and interest rates go up, the debt service cost is going to snap up very quickly. And at that point, that debt service cost is going to crowd out everything else that we want the federal government to do. Um, fellow member of the commission with Dave and uh, Andy, former uh, boss of mine, Congressman John Spratt of South Carolina, who uh, I'll betray my political feelings very unfortunately, uh, lost his bid for re-election back in November, uh, said once uh, to a, a group of his constituents, and I happened to be there, People sometimes say that they don't like the federal government because they pay a lot in taxes and they don't see anything coming back. Now, people sometimes forget little things like national security, but let's put that aside. <laughs> to the extent that you pay income taxes and what you get for that is the federal government paying interest on the debt, that little story that I just told is absolutely true. All you get for paying interest on the debt, when you get right down to it, is that the Acme Collection Agency does not back a truck up to the White House and repossess the furniture. That's all you get. You don't get any national security. You don't get any highways. You don't get social security. You don't get anything else. And so John Spratt went on to say, if you want to make people cynical about the federal government, about their own country's uh, uh, institutions, run up the debt, increase the cost of servicing that debt, and have people pay more and more in taxes and get absolutely nothing in return. So for lots of reasons, for economic reasons and for the reasons of how we feel about our country and about our government, this is a problem that must be addressed and it must be addressed soon. So again, to Dave and Andy, thank you very much for the work you put in. And uh, I hope that uh, we see it bear fruit at some time in the very near future.